talk to you guys all today. Welcome to Real-Time Mobility, the rise of wearables and augmented reality. I'm one of Upskill's founders, and we are a software company that specializes in low-code B2B software that helps our customers create, manage, and deploy applications for the connected workforce. And we differentiate uh, over most low-code software out there in that our end users are predominantly using wearables, i.e. smart glasses, uh, kind of like this, as their primary mobile computing device. Uh, this is a very exciting frontier in B2B software. And my goal over the next uh, half hour or so is to impart some of the experiences that we've had with our company uh, deploying this into the real world and cover the use cases, constraints, and some of the tips and tricks uh, as it corresponds to, uh, in particular, the importance and how you uh, take this and build real applications with it. Now, obviously, for most of the past decade, uh, the primary computing device uh, du jour has been uh, your phone or a tablet. Um, but in the connected workspace, there are significant differences in the way people operate uh, on a factory floor or in a warehouse uh, that mean there's new things you need to take into consideration uh, when building software. Which brings me uh, to part one of the talk, uh, wearables and the deskless workforce. Uh, now, many of us, uh, or for many of us, I should say, smart glasses, uh, i.e. augmented reality wearables, were not at the tip of our tongue. Uh, and it wasn't really until 2013 when Google Glass literally leapt out of an airplane and into our vernacular that that became something that I think many of us were familiar with. Our company actually started three years before that, working on what is now known as mixed reality uh, for the US military. And I'm going to put up some long lost photos just to show what some of these early smart glasses looked like. Um, in one case, you may have some uh, early monocular or binocular glasses. Um, and we thought these were the early days, uh, but wearables and in particular wearable visual interfaces have been in the sci-fi domain for decades, but they've also been real. Fighter pilots have had them. They may have been half a million dollars more a piece but they've had them um, decades before the centered kind of common um, uh, use cases. But those early and very expensive breakthroughs paved the way for what eventually became full functioning heads up displays in the mid nineties. The ensuing breakthroughs though, that truly made them mobile though, took another two decades to come along. And I think it's, it's exciting to see how they've come, where they're at now and kind of what might be coming with the future as we kind of break through some of these physics that have constrained wearables uh, over the past couple decades. So I bucket them in, a, this is a simplified version of the world uh, for the purpose of uh, the presentation today, but I bucket them in a couple kind of key categories. First is power density. I mean, the ability for us to be truly mobile, uh, you can think about how it's changed the world in terms of smartphones. Um, the battery density that we're able to carry with us has dramatically improved over the past couple of years and continues to do so. Wireless communications, which is uh, kind of the chart in the center. Uh, this is the advances in Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, now 5G, uh, are major breakthroughs when it comes into how do we connect our devices to the systems that drive them. Um, you know, if you look at the start date on the chart here, um, you know, it's interesting that like some of the math behind the, 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 the Wi-Fi domains that are, are powering all these use cases were solved in the 50s, but it wasn't until the late 90s that they were able to put that compute on a chip and we could actually take advantage of them. I mean, to me, these first two are the biggest gates that had to fall for this tech to even be viable in a mobile environment. We did need closer all day battery life, or at least some like the newer quick charge capabilities to supplement it. And we needed this Wi-Fi for uh, more robust and reliable communications. But the performance we get from Moore's Law, which is the chart on, on your right, I mean, this is tightly coupled to all those other things. The battery life we need, we get more efficiency per clock cycle with uh, higher density transistors. So we're not ignoring that, but those first two really were the gates um, that have changed the trajectory of wearables over the last couple of years. Finally, at the bottom, uh, optics. Obviously, there are really amazing um, optics technologies that are out there. Um, some of the fundamental principles haven't changed that much, but it's given us advances for things like dual optic waveguide uh, for HoloLens. It gives us the quarter wave polarizers for Google Glass and reflective optics for smart glasses like North that have very thin displays and look a lot more like normal glasses. 
There's tons of resources out on each of these, but one of the things I wanted to illustrate is how these physics curves have been changing and what that means for the future of wearables and why if you haven't been paying attention to them, why you should pay attention uh, now. Now, what I just held up with those different devices, all of those have surfed those waves of all the dependent technologies, and we now have smart glasses that look more or less like real glasses. The thing that's interesting is them is 90% of them share the exact same DNA as a smartphone that may be in your pocket. And what I mean by that is, let me take a, an exploded view of one of those devices like HoloLens for just a second. Those components may not look very familiar, but when we really zoom in and look at them, like one part of them, that's essentially the, the motherboard for your phone. Another part, the, the optics is the equivalent of your screen. The rest of it though is essentially just the case or, or the body of your phone. It's holding all those parts together in the battery. So the DNA is, of these devices is very, very similar. And what that means is we have a new physical medium that we're dealing with, but it is surprisingly mature. We all know how to build software for mobile devices. The existing operating systems give us a huge boost in compatibility with these new tool chains that we may be embracing. But the applications that run on them, what we find is we need to take into account how they're used and some of the key differences in user experience to make sure that those applications are satisfying to the end user. And it's that whole UX that we need to think about, not just the UI aspects. I'm sure everyone in this conference can appreciate that and maybe liken this to the development paradigms for how mobility came about with screen size, inputs, et cetera how those change as we develop for mobile devices versus the desktop computer predecessors. I don't think we were very successful if anyone took a desktop app UI and tried to jam it onto the mobile device and call it a day. How we use devices matters. So these end users are indeed using them in different ways. I'm gonna get into that for you guys today so that uh, if you do go after this kind of greenfield opportunity, we don't run into a case where our connected workers are likely to reject these new user experiences because there's a ton of value that it can bring to them. All right, so let me set the stage uh, on who this new connected worker is. Uh, these workers are definitely not your PowerPoint jockeys or Zoom conference occupants. These are the folks on the manufacturing floor. They're the ones in your material handling whose hands are on the job. Their focus is up on the work that they're doing. It could be the repair person who is either in the field or maybe servicing machines at these factories. Maybe the person that's packed up your latest e-commerce order. But all of these individuals have a job to do whose effectiveness is tied to how much time uh, they have on the job they're doing, like touch time on part. It's the accuracy of their work, which may translate into something called first time quality. The, these businesses and these users improve on those metrics by being able to stay more focused on the job they're doing at that exact time, or by being able to access information they need to do it more effectively or more accurately. And this information could come from another person, like a remote expert, it could be a, a, maybe somebody from another company that's helping diagnose something with a machine that you bought from them. It may also come directly from IoT systems or business process systems that help define and drive kind of the order of operations on the work floor, or maybe synchronize the different pieces of the task together. Which means that the work here is almost always real time in nature. Manufacturing lines can very much operate sort of like a computer clock cycle, but in that world it's called tap time. And you know, this time of year, I'm sure we can all appreciate how cutthroat logistics is in terms of timing of how tight the shipping windows need to be and how real time in nature those delivery predictions need to be. So you have all these human in the loop, or maybe the human is the process, um, sort of roles that are happening inside the critical path of these businesses. And when we look at them, you know, you know, we think through, you know, Six Sigma and a bunch of these other like kind of business processes meant around optimization that maybe they're already kind of leaned out. And the reality is they're not. There's a ton of waste in these systems that a new approach to real time computing and connected workers can actually really help address. And this is the opportunity, I think, for all of us when we're building software to solve for these problems. So we analyzed where these current process failures are. And for simplicity, I've bin them into kind of four major buckets. So first and foremost, economy of motion. If I have to move somewhere, if I have to get up from the area I'm working and go to look up something or take time to pull my phone out of my pocket and query it, that is time lost um, in an economy of motion. 
economy of focus is the context switching overhead of moving from the doing to the learning or the accessing information, um, which is just a, a cost every human pays anytime we try and multitask. Um, but there could be real time spent when you're actually doing the lookup if it's not part of your work process. Uh, human error, this, is, this comes in all sorts of different forms. Rote memorization is something that human beings are generally not the best at. Um, transcription is one. We fat finger, misenter information all the time. Also, you just get overloaded sometimes, and it's something called cognitive overload, where if you're trying to keep track of all these things and, and try and stay on time and manage all this different information, it can overload your thought processes, and it's another area where human error creeps in. And finally, there's when we look at this more um, kind of uh, solution engineering base, which is uh, absence of a feedback loop. Whenever we don't have real-time access to information or the systems that power them, there's an opportunity for us to store up or queue up information, maybe put it in later, maybe, maybe try and remember how we did it before it's entered back in, or maybe our processes don't give us the time to do it properly, and we don't put as much insight back into the system, which means our organizations can't benefit from that information that could feed new process discovery, optimization, or better orchestration across the system. So when we look at this holistically, there's a lot of different areas um, where this creeps in. Um, Interestingly, though, it is almost never skill. You take away all these issues and you find that people are extremely good at what they do if they've been trained in it. Think about uh, assuming you've even driven your car enough this year to need it, changing the oil in your car. Whether it's you or your mechanic, you've got the basic skills to do that job already. But do you know off the top of your head the wrench size, torque for the filter, what filter you need or the oil that you or the customer may have requested? Maybe not. And if you don't, what of all of these four different processes do you go through to get that information? Where is it stored? Is there is it in a book? Is it a screen near you? How do you query it? Do you type something in? What if your hands are covered in oil? All these things, uh, I think, in a very simple use case, start really highlighting where the areas are to improve. So I'm going to take a second, and I'm going to show you this in action. So what I'm about to show you is uh, aircraft engine repair. You're not going to see the uh, screen that the person sees, but you'll see the impact of it. And on one side, in the baseline scenario, this trained professional who does this every day is going through a set of procedures uh, to inspect and uh, uh, repair an engine. And on the other side, they're doing the exact same process, but all the information they need is in their field of view. It's also automatically interacting with a system to document all of the work being done, which is something they did not get in this process in the paper side. And we're also showcasing uh, to that person the information coming off connected tools around them so they have insights that they didn't have before. So all those little like bits of motion, bits of looking up information really added up. And this was an hour long process that we saved 33% in by changing the way that connected worker operates. And you could argue that they weren't really connected before. They were just doing the work. So you can see how you get a really big lift in this technology. Now, which brings me to the future of work. So why go after this uh, environment? First off, the deskless workforce is enormous. Roughly half of the global workforce uh, would be would count in this number of, you know, I make, move, and service uh, goods. Uh, and in the G2000, which we see has more uh, likely digitized backends, which helps drive um, the, the cost of implementation down, there's at least 40 million people in the US, APAC, and Europe alone. So the opportunity we see here is how do we augment that workforce and not just automate it away? And I think automotive is a great example of this, where you have essentially two types of uh, worker in the, in the manufacturing environment. You have robotic automation and you have human uh, capital. The only real difference between these two is that one is connected to a real-time system providing exactly the information that that system needs to accomplish its job and the other doesn't. So when we look at these opportunities, like how can we bring in new user interfaces, uh, connections to the machines or people around them, there's massive opportunity to unlock this potential and smart glasses give us a way to change that in a way that's almost natural. So to give you a sense of what these real-time interfaces could look like for your workforce and how this can change the game, here's a little montage of what it would look like with just simple heads-up display, which is one of the classes of devices that's, that's out there right now. 
We'll let this roll for a little bit. What you see is information that helps assist these people when they're doing their different types of roles. They're not having to put down their tools. They're not having to pick up different manuals or computers, but they're now seeing information that corresponds to exactly the step of the process that they need and may help verify it. It's not just in the manufacturing floor. We see it in oil and gas. We see it in mining, logistics, warehouses, pharmaceutical companies, there's really no end to the number of use cases that can be uh, unlocked with a real-time interface. So it's pretty exciting to see like, you know, when that impact in human productivity, I think can change the game for folks. Which brings me to part two, the ecosystems uh, to help you guys understand what, what can you work with uh, to unlock this feature, uh, the connected worker. So when we think about this kind of new GPS for your job, there's all sorts of different types of use cases. The information has been there forever. There's now new ecosystems that have evolved to help tap into uh, these use cases. Now, my company Upskill, our perspective is entirely based around the future of work, but depending on the role you see in the work you do, you may wanna like go after some of the future of home use cases. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the constraints of both of them. So in the future of work, what we're looking at that drives a value in today's economy is use cases that are always on where the person can be always connected. And what I mean by that is if I show up at my um, station where I work, if I can put on a connected worker solution, it doesn't even need to be wearable specifically, but that solution needs to be with me. The whole process is helping every step of my way. Um, that's one of the big things that if I can get that, that benefit at every part of my process, the ROI is really, really clear. What we see in the home environment is the, the average home user, they are looking for something that's a little bit more immersive, but not present with me all day long. That needs to be available, but only when it's relevant. Otherwise I'm at my home life, generally context switching to through more stuff during the course of a day. Drivers for why people engage with these in the work, it's about accuracy, it's about uh, productivity, it's about can I connect my technicians to an expert, can I share knowledge in a way that couldn't have been done easily before. In the home environment, generally it's around novelty, entertainment, think about your Snapchat filters on a, on a, like a, a conference call, like maybe it's something to make your kids laugh a little bit more. But generally, it's something about how do you engage my attention for a period of time and make it more fun and more interesting? Like, is Monopoly more interesting if you see the car physically race around the track versus you're pushing it? Who knows? But those are the sorts of things that people are looking at. One of the other key things in the content production side of uh, Future of Home is companies that are building these use cases are looking for existing device access. In the future of work, if a new device unlocks a use case, they look at it like a tool. They'll buy the tool that helps do the job. In the consumer world, we're generally looking at, can I rent an experience or buy an experience that supports the phone I may already have? So device access is a big driver in how people approach the future of home ecosystems. And that's generally around your iOS or your Android ecosystems uh, or some other cloud um, uh, provider. On the constraint side of things, there are also things that are working against these use cases that we need to make sure that we can check the box, otherwise uh, they'll fail. Um, and for future of work, and what we're looking at is, can it do the job all day? Is it comfortable? Is it safe? Is it secure? Generally, these things are dealing with critical business information. And then finally, like, is it indeed hands-free? Otherwise, maybe I have an existing tool for it. In the future of home side, we're generally looking at things that, uh, meet the drivers, but in short engagement periods. So if I've got 15 minutes or half an hour to watch a show or play a game, is that experience something I can create and contain in that uh, kind of sample size that's really gonna drive an interest out of me? One of the other things that comes into play is like, all right, how do we create the graphics for those? And the consumer side, that's generally an artistic thing versus in the work side, it tends to be a design thing. Very, very different skill sets. Uh, one tends to be uh, more cost effective and ready than the other, but it's something that comes into play. Network connectivity and cloud-based ecosystems also are one of the biggest drivers in consumer. Uh, in the in post-COVID world, we're seeing more uh, cloud embracing uh, on the, the work side. 
but we're not ever expecting to see somebody willing to install uh, you know, their own servers in order to run an experience. So you're looking at something where can I pull information from the cloud, meet the graphics and the engagement model I'm looking for, but those ecosystems generally are driven from the cloud down rather than pulled from the device up. And obviously, the way this is paid for, um, the a lot of the cost offset is either through massive numbers or through advertising offset, similar to like you may be buying or sorry, a provider may be buying advertising on Google Maps in order to create that uh, that plug over to them, but you're really just consuming the map because you want to know where to go. Um, so we see these different things come into play. Now, as that filters out to the different device types, what we find is the smart glasses that drive business value don't come over into the um, home ecosystems very often. And the devices in the home, your high-end Android or, or iOS, don't often end up on the factory floor or in the warehouse all that often. They certainly do. But the benefits we get if we meet the drivers and constraints using smart glasses actually often outweigh the convenience of already having uh, iOS or Android phones. So we see these ecosystems split out slightly differently. But then you get you know, the content providers, the folks who are building the core tech on the software side and in the home environment, these tend to be the consumer companies you already know. Um, I did put North in there as a smart glasses vendor that's now inside Google on the consumer side, but you also have a lot of these other ecosystems at play. It's a very different list for the most part than the folks who are building the connectivity, the AIs, the design software, the connected worker software, and even the the deployment and training capabilities on the enterprise ecosystem. So if you find yourself in one of these for your customers and looking across to the other, I think it's great to know kind of what you're getting into and the different players that are out there. This is also a very small snapshot of the overall ecosystem, but these are a lot of the top players in the space. So taking that into consideration for a second, um, I want to look at the common use cases and how this uh, plays out in in the current, I think, time frame of what people are trying to solve for and where some of the highest return on investments are for customers right now. So we've got a number of what we think of as roles or use cases for deskless workers and what uh, these different categories are. Work instructions are anything where I'm taking the digitized information about how do I produce something and maybe a set of steps I need to follow, uh, things I might need to follow for a process resolution or search through, that's work instructions. Vision picking is the industry term now for how you're elevating a pick list off of maybe a paper pick process and into something. Hey, hold on one second, baby. Hi, daddy, yes. Daddy's recording a conference. <laughs> sorry, real time. Um, so, pick. Uh, sorry, vision picking is when we've got a the elevation of a logistics pick order, a kitting order, or maybe a retail fulfillment order that's going from a paper process or something on your um, uh, mobile handheld, and we're bringing it up into your field of view, so you have both hands to do the pick. We've seen enormous gains in that uh, area. Inspection audit, this is everything from uh, technical inspection and certification, which means somebody's going through a vis visual inspection of a site, a process, a thing. This is actually something where you take advantage of the camera that's forward facing on glasses and you can open up all new use cases for real time computer vision to augment your workflows, maybe automatically dictate, record, spot errors, a really, really exciting new frontier. IoT integration is kind of what I talked about before and in, in where you get all of the information of the connected machines, tools around you. And in a lot of cases, you've never before been able to see those interfaces when you're actually hands on your job. We can bring that in and enhance the user's understanding of what's happening around them as they're doing it. So imagine turning a wrench, seeing the real-time value off the torque wrench or seeing the result of that input on the machine that you just did it. Maybe it's changing some configuration based off of a Titan setting. The last two, expert knowledge capture or remote collaboration, are helping document tribal knowledge either in the, I'm trying to record something for a learning management system from the field of view of my you know, first person field of view, or can I bring in one or more experts from around the globe to help assist with something in real time? 
And we're finding this actually be a really great use case for folks to get started, particularly in COVID where you know we might have been able to easily put somebody on a plane, fly out, resolve an issue. Now we're finding we don't even need to get folks on the plane. If they can take advantage of their IT assets and some connected workforce software, we can push down resolution or real-time collaboration to help solve for that. So each of these use cases are something where we found really high ROI in uh, companies that have a digitalized uh, process. They're also really easy to get into uh, workflows. And then they work out really well in these highly mobile form factors like smart glasses or mixed reality glasses. Um, and in a lot of cases, like you know, you may already have some of the, the solution already built for other form factors. And by moving to something more mobile, your connected workforce can even get a bigger, bigger ROI. Now, the form factor and the use case certainly play into it. One thing I wanted to hit on is, you know, every time that we design a, uh, an application on behalf of our customer, help them through it. One of the things we have to take into account is how is the data structured in a way that works in a real time scenario. And in our world, this is something that we call work sessions, but I wanted to highlight kind of four major scenarios that come into play um, that work sessions help illustrate. Um, first one of these is procedural procedural handoff. Like when we're working in connected workforce areas, we may have uh, people working across shifts where we need to hand off uh, workflows between one part of the process to another. It's also very important. And again, we've got this real time connectivity. We can document what's happened along the way for worker A, worker B takes over. They can replay that work, see it, make sure, understand what's happened and keep going with it. Or in case of a um, regulated industry, you know who did the work, when they did it, what was done, which can play into your QA strategy um, or warranty strategy. Cross-role data synchronization is something we think about in terms of you may have folks with different roles that may have different responsibilities in some of this real-time work. It could be you know, if I'm responsible for validating that I did certain work, but I need my manager to come in at a certain Point because it's super important. I need a second set of eyes to sign off on it. It could be from a certification standpoint. This cross-role data synchronization is important. And I'll, I'll, I'll hit on this in a, in a couple slides as to how this actually kind of plays out in the real world. And one of the most important things you need to think about from your design perspective. Real-time collaboration. Uh, you know, in 2019, I think the, the most of us thought about real-time collaboration in terms of we hop on a FaceTime call, we have a conference call, we think about, you know, what are we going to do? And we, we debate it. This is starting to change as more and more workers are connected. We're having layered uh, interactions between the underlying data model in your real-time collaboration and the people's interactions on top of it. So what we think about in terms of work se sessions are, how do you design software such that your data, the workflow, and then the people who may be working both inside or outside the scope of that data are all able to operate on the same set at the same time? Um, and finally, add the same place in there as well, which is spatial collaboration. When you get into use cases that take advantage of very precise sensing uh, for spatial compute, where work is done becomes something that can be a real advantageous piece of data that you can also put in your, your work models. So these are things that we think about in terms of our work sessions. Uh, there's a lot more you can do with these, um, but uh, I'm gonna move on to our part three, which is taking into account designing for the connected worker. So with what I showed you before, I hope I've painted a good picture in terms of who the people are, how they're using it, and hinted at some of the things that, that need to be considered when, um, when we're embracing this new real-time paradigm. But uh, I'll start this section um, kind of covering again, like we think about things at upscale in terms of three major different categories. We have handheld, which is mobile, but not real-time mobile. Like most of the time it lives in our, in our pocket or on our desk only when we take ourselves out of work for a second and pay attention to it are we engaged. Hands-free, this is your heads-up display. And if anyone's got a heads-up display, maybe in your car windshield or been a fighter pilot before, you know the value that this brings, having information that's unobstructed, but in your field of view when you need it. Um, and then finally, immersive, which is our mixed reality devices. 
this is the next phase of compute where if you need information that's extremely precise in your field of view, or you want to take advantage of a larger um, viewable area, i.e. the entire world around you just by where you're looking, you can move into that, um, that form factor as well. It has a different set of constraints, but you're still in this highly mobile real-time environment. So, which brings me to the design for real-time work issue number one. Um, and this uh, is something that at Upskill uh, is you know, nine of our first 10 commandments or the same thing as every rule at Fight Club, which is there is no Wi-Fi. Um, we, we, we always assume uh, that when you're dealing with real-time data, the first thing you need to consider is what happens if you lose connection to the internet. And I, I put this photo up as a joke, but um, I'll, I'll take this into a little bit more serious domain for a second. So. Designing for connectivity loss is super important. In the areas that we operate, it could be out in the middle of a field, it could be at the top of a wind turbine, you may lose connectivity. And this includes just, even in areas that have really great Wi-Fi connectivity, just moving across the different base stations could cause a cutout, or if you happen to op walk into an area that just happens to have a little bit of packet loss, it could disrupt your data. So. This, uh, one of the things that we see when we're dealing with the user interfaces uh, for folks that are wearing smart glasses versus uh, holding something on your phone is when the, the user experience is in your field of view, the frustration is multiplied uh, when you lose connectivity. So you need to think about things that you can do to mitigate that um, kind of in reverse order. Uh, any user experience or UI specifically interaction uh, that can be asynchronous from the business logic should be. Uh, you can liken this to if you're playing like a real time you know, racing game, like and you turn your hand or something, you wanna see the steering wheel move so you know the computer got that. Maybe the traction's messed up a little bit, but you have to have a hierarchy of how you design things so that you're signaling back to the user that the software sees what the user did and then lets the user know whether or not the system's able to respond to that. Um, it's a very, very important thing to get right the first time. Two simple things you can do to help this, and this is what I was hinting on before with the, uh, the work session model. Understanding the overall work session and being able to cache data down to the device, either before or very quickly behind the scenes as work's being done is a great way to help mitigate uh, some of the gotchas in the Wi-Fi land. The other one is synchronizing data continuously. So we don't rely on information staying on the device uh, until you choose to get the information off the device later. Generally speaking, we're looking at opportunistically, how do we synchronize data with anything else in the system that may need access to it at any opportunity we can to make sure there's a real-time context. This plays out when you look at those other uh, couple um, groupings I had before, where maybe you have people with different roles that need to interact with the same data, or maybe you're collaborating in space as well. So we try and make sure that we're thinking about that as much as possible and designing software in such a way that it's gracefully degrading uh, with network loss. So if, if you uh, leave with little other than that, you're on a good start. Um, the second one, uh, I'm gonna use this as an example, but uh, to illustrate as we migrate from desktop or mobile UI uh, to heads up display, issue two comes into all of the constraints around screen real estate. Um, if you aren't uh, already using a wearable software platform and have a lot of experience with this, if you're gonna jump into it, I recommend um, hiring a designer or, or consulting with one um, to kind of accelerate your understanding in the space. But certainly, uh, you know, this as an example is not uh, the type of information that's well organized if you're trying to stay heads up and hands free uh, on your job. So we think about this in terms of information is organized very differently in the design phase, which is what you might be looking at here, which is how a wire harness designer thought about laying out this information. They may have dependencies on other systems to validate these connections, to tie into some of their supply chain or, or ordering information, or maybe even just a, a QA system. That's different than the manufacturing execution side, which is in the do phase, which is I am pushing information down that's critical at that moment, but I might not need this full context. So what that might look like is as I'm at a certain part of that, that uh, build, maybe I only need to see a piece of the information and I've got a limited amount of space to do it in. Now, most heads up display, which um, I'm showing you an example of heads up display is similar to having a small or medium tablet about arm's length from your face. 
So your your field of view is constrained into a, a window that's a couple inches. They're the equivalent of a couple inches um, in each direction, or maybe you know 10, 15 inches diagonally. But you can't click on those buttons. If I wanted to to scroll or pan around, how am I doing that? Um, I may have to use head gestures. I may use voice as a critical interface. But these are things that need to be thought about um, as you design these interactions. The next one um, is actually something that uh, we think about in terms of additive light displays. So, in uh, something like Google Glass, like when I when I put it on. Like I'm looking through the display. Well, right now I'm looking through the display. I might be uh, kind of looking just slightly down from it in normal use, but it the way I see the pixels that are lit up is it's it's lighting up parts of the display that are um, shown in white here. Anything that's black is transparent. So in this uh, in this graphic that we put together, it's showing you know a gradation effect, but realistically I'd be able to see straight through this and only the text and some of the bars and icons would I be able to see. So if I had nothing on the display, ideally it looks a little bit more like this. So we have to take color space uh, into account, not only in terms of the, the color choices we make, but also the fact that there's an absence of color in some cases. Um, and I have to take into account like whether or not that's I'm operating in a very bright environment or not when I design software. Want to hit on uh, color for a second. The example I showed before um, showed a very, very dense screen with a lot of colors on it. Now, depending on your customer, that may be something they, they dictate. One of the things that we find is when we're using um, these additive displays, Less is again more. Um, you're looking to emphasize both uh, where the person should be looking. So maybe if at a point in time they should be looking at this this thing labeled T on here, it's much easier to see it in that second image uh, to the side than the one where they all have color and they're all pulling your attention away. One of the other things you may need to do is use shapes. Um, you know, there is color confusion um, as well as color blindness that needs to be taken into consideration. But when you have added displays, uh, red confusion and, and green confusion can come into play if the, the tones are too close to each other. So it's something you should think about as well and also use shape to help drive emphasis. Now, navigating, um, this is something we think about, uh, again, in the heads up display as two of the, the interaction styles that people have when they're dealing with uh, smart glasses. One is search, as in I want to, actually, let me just go to these two modes. So there's search and consume. The search is I'll know, I'll know it when I see it, as in I'm going to scroll through something and, aha, that's the thing I want to do. The I know what I want is show me you know, the weather today or show me this. I know exactly the step I want. Now I want to see the information that's associated with it, which is like show me the oil filter for the car I'm working on right now. And when we think about how we construct these displays, we often think about them in terms of what is the overall view that this person sees and how they're going to move through it. How do you create um, visual cues in these small spaces, which are also meant to be uh, non-interfering with the real view of the world at the same time? So another couple things to, to keep in mind as you're, you're building these, these user experiences. The final one, and I'll, I'll touch on this for, for a second, um, is mixed reality. Uh, mixed reality is uh, where I'm injecting digital content into the field of view, but I'm geo-locking it into the real world itself. So if I put that uh, maintenance schematic up by that machine in mixed reality, and I walk around it, it maintains its position in space. Uh, if I'm sharing that positional data with my team, they would see it in that exact same space as well. We can manipulate it. Very, very exciting capability. It generally means you have a lot more sensing technology um, and almost always a, um, a binocular set of smart glasses in order to pull that off. I mean, you can also do that with a with a smartphone, but you're holding the smartphone up and, and looking through it, and it's adding that to the camera view rather than um, what appears to your eyes to be in, in real space. So for mixed reality, the design constraints change a little bit. You have a lot more real estate to work with. You can put information in every location around you. So one of the things that comes into play is you think about how to not overload people with information. We also have a new constraint around safety in the sense that I can be blocking your field of view. If I have a really, really bright white light source and I make it look like a door, you may think there's a door there because you can't quite tell the difference as optics get better and better. 
that it's really there, which makes great April Fool's tricks, but it's definitely not things that we encourage on the factory floor. So our recommendations is to think about how you can keep information as minimal as possible until it is needed. So you can uh, create clues in 3D space that there's an object you can interact with here, but don't have the PDF for the machine open at all times, only when they need it, click on it. And then one of the other things that we would recommend is keep the instructions slightly out of the way, unless you're doing um, things that are uh, smaller in scale and not gonna block the person's view of the machine themselves or the, the thing they're working with. Um, one other thing that we recommend is, unless you're in a training scenario, um, avoid heavy animations as well. It goes back to the mechanic thing. They know how to turn a torque wrench. They know how to do their job. What they may just need to know is, hey, this bolt needs to come out. Don't show me an animation of a screwdriver taking it out unless that's a very, fir very first time they might see it. So some things to, to consider for, for mixed reality. So um, before we get to questions, um, I wanted to close with some thoughts on... Um, you know, how you may experience this. And, you know, from our experience, like we've gone through a lot of these, um, these learnings over the last handful of years and have gotten, um, you know, a particular point of view around how do you create a life cycle around making this as easy as possible for somebody to quickly develop solutions on while taking all those lessons learned into account. So Skylight's our product, it's our culmination of these different things. Um, if you're curious, happy to, to uh, help anyone give it a spin. Uh, we're having a hackathon next week. Um, there's a link at the bottom of the the um, the presentation uh, area that says hackathon. Feel free to click on it. We'd love to have you. Um, there's also a handful of different resources uh, that are out there as well. Uh, again, two more links at the bottom. One is for the area, which is the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance. It's an organization dedicated to helping people understand how to take advantage of the different technologies that are out there and also study the use cases and impacts uh, that may affect the way you approach development if you choose to get into this space. And finally, annually, there's a conference called EWTS, which is uh, the practitioners and um, most of the, the global business customers in the B2B world around um, enterprise wearables. Uh, it's called the EWTS, which is the Enterprise Wearable Technology Summit. It's a great resource um, if this is an area you're just getting into. And with that, I'd love to take anyone's questions.